Welcome everyone to this second day of the conference. We hope to, you had a good time last evening and enjoy the Beowulf. I'm happy to give you some numbers about this year conference. So in total, there is more than 200 people that will come to Namur. There is a French track today on the fourth floor and to, tomorrow there will be students that will discover Plon and his community. There is also more than 130 uh, registration from 23 different countries and we are really happy to have uh, so many people this year. And now for the second keynote, we are pleased to have Johan Jans and Olivier Vergainst that will talk about ICT and mineral extraction. <coughs> but yeah. So, many thanks for your attention. Um, maybe are you wondering what about geology and mineral extraction today in this kind of meeting in your life? You probably know. Uh, yes, yes, this is. Here. You probably know that each human society is based on the earth, techniques and products. Age of stones, we extract stones. And there is stones at the end of the age of stone. Calcopyric, with copper and so on, with bronze, with tin, with iron. The Romans know seven metals, that is why we have seven days. For instance, the Saturday is for Saturn and for lead, because in French, the Saturnism is the lead poisoning, is the less disease. And we are in the Anthropocene, the age of the evo industrial revolution, and we extract a lot, and I remember this to my student, a lot of fossil fuels, including now. For electricity, we extract coal, gas, oil and we know that for a couple of months with you know the act, the, the media and this is only for ah, yes this is only for electricity which is itself 20 percent of the production of energy in belgium so for 20 percent of this energy for electricity we need this and we are now in a transition this is slow very slow 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 to the age of the electron. We extract each element of the Mendeleev table at the moment. Yes, especially for this. This is why you are here, this is why I am here. So this is this prosium, ah yes, ah, it, will be, it will be a sketch. This is this prosium, neodym, praseodym, samarium, terbium, which are rare earth elements, but also base metals such as this one that you probably know, especially lithium, cobalt, manganese, and nickel for the batteries. So for this kind of daily product, at least for the half of the population at the moment on Earth, you need this kind of element. For screen, indium is very interesting. Electronics, copper, silver, gold, and so on for batteries, you know that at the moment because this is popularized in the media for a couple of years now. This is also the case for green technologies with a lot, but a lot of metals and non-metal materials such as this one, once again for 
wind turbines a lot of hard earth elements, especially neodymium and dysprosium, D -E and ND. Yes. And this is well known for a couple of for a couple of years, for at least one decade, that it will concern a lot of metals for green technology than oil and uranium energy, but of course, green technologies consumes less oil and uranium. So this is the case, and well known and published for one decade now. It is also the case for concrete. You need more concrete and more glass and sand for and just non-metal for wind and photovolcanic energy than coal-fired power plant. This is easy to understand, but this is interesting to remind this to my students each year because this is unknown in Belgium for the, a lot of reasons. So do you have the price of copper from this to now, and you can see that for a lot of uh, decades, price are very low. This is why we had a low investment in geological resources, because prices are low. And you have, more important my point of view, low investment in human resources, and a low communication and popularization about these resources. This is completely unknown. This is why, with the supply and the demand, you have a large increase at the beginning of this century. And some colleagues, mainly economics, told me that this is a new increase for a couple of years. Not related directly to this, this is in French, but it is easy to understand, because if you have a look on the prices of copper from February to 22, the initiation of the war in Ukraine, you can see that the prices are higher earlier much earlier. This is a structural problem. This is not especially due to one point in the, in the world. This is the case for copper. This is the case for uranium. This is the case... This is the case for gold. February 22. This is not the case for gas. Of course, I would say. So what is mining? This is interesting. If you need silver, you need an element with f 47 protons. This is what you need when you need silver. And you, you can extract it from this kind of uh, rocks from a mineral, and you have silver within the mineral, but there are a lot of other elements, and within the rock. And in this rock, the rate of silver is 0.01%. So your deal is, of course, to have this. You have to transform to this. And you have a lot of techniques, well known for centuries, in fact. It requires a lot of volume, a lot of water, a lot of energy, a lot of knowledge of Homo sapiens. This is why the human resources are very important. So this is profitable. This is an ore. 0.1. This is 5,000 more than in the average crust. This is why this is profitable, even if it looks quite low. And uh, this is important. In Western Europe and in other countries, you need an authorization to extract. This is not the case everywhere in the world. I will show you that. And you can see that we extract a lot of iron. 2.5 billion tons, a lot of manganese, chromium, and so on. In fact, we extract each year 92 billion tons of geological resources. This is more than 13 million swimming pools. This is one swimming pool is each two seconds. one swimming pool extracted from the earth. Because 92 billion tons, you mean, why, yes, we are to but what about that? Why and how? In this kind of mine, and you, well, you know that. But this is poorly 
popularized at the moment with high technology, non metals in the uh, European Union, but metals mainly out of European Union, of course. Or some pictures, I will show you the various pictures because you are here to have pictures, not to have a lot of text. This is no reason. Uh, a nice quarry in Belgium, five kilometers far from here, from Namur, the largest quarry of dolomites of Europe, five kilometers far from here. But for metals, mainly not in Europe, mainly out of Europe. This is cobalt, so the batteries you have needs cobalt at the moment. And cobalt is extracted 60% of cobalt of the world, 60, not 16, 60% is extracted from this level. I know this is incredible, but this is true. This kind of level, each around the ERC, of course. This is mining with mining companies of manganese out of Europe now, not one century ago, now with a PhD student from University of Namur looking for the, the, the ore in black, the pits, the digger out of the pits, the digger with the ore, and the black face, quite similar for people know that than the black face a couple of decades and two, two centuries ago in Belgium, but elsewhere in France and UK. But the second way for mining is this, what is called artisanal mining in French, but also in English, because this is a word in French, because it, it has been taken in Congo, and Congo is a tradition of French speaking. So you have backs, and follow the backs, the backs, the backs are very important. You can clean the back with someone there. You can control it. The back, the bags are transported by children, and you can imagine that this is malachite. This is a mineral with a lot of copper. You follow the back into the car. The car transport the bags into the trucks, and we stay in our car in this case because it become quite dangerous. And we follow to this, this uh, gate. What about a lot of copper, zinc, bronze, aluminium, and so on? And what about these chimneys just over there? These are furnaces, in fact, and you recognize the bags. Furnaces, artisanal, of course, to produce these ingots. This is following the World Bank about 20% of cobalt or copper in DRC. And DRC produce 60% of cobalt of the world. It means that about 12% of the cobalt I have in my smartphone come from this kind of extraction. So this is the same in another country in Africa. You follow the tracks, you have the road and people with pits in the road, with hammer, they have bags, the same than in other countries, with donkeys in this case, to the cars, and so on, you can imagine. This is in 2020. This is not in one century ago, this picture. I'm sure about it, I took the picture. So the main producers of metals are not European Union, and you can see that this is mainly other countries, well known, this is well known at the moment, and China. And in Europe, we have a few metal production, mainly graphite, lithium, nickel, and cobalt, which is a byproduct of nickel in copper. This is not a production of cobalt itself, this is a byproduct. And you can see that in France, for instance, and Belgium, no extraction but smelteries and refineries, especially for indium. So European Union constats, and uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a first report in 2010, that we have 
critical raw material. It means that these material ha have an economic importance and a supply risk. And if you combine the both the, the character, you have this critical raw material. Of course, niobium is a critical for Europe, not for Brazil, because Brazil is the main producer of niobium. This is a new report in 2020, but this is the same picture, in fact, with uh, some, uh, yes, with new metals. Have a look on the previous one. Uh, yes. Lithium is here, not critical, no problem for lithium at this moment, but now, uh, yes, lithium is here. It evolves. So for the future, this is a nice, nice picture in, uh, in uh, teaching in uh, the sustainable development I have at the moment. Uh, this is very green. You can imagine that all eyes at the moment directly have a look on this and the metals we need for this. For this, uh, this is a lot of metals. The bus cycles also for the wind turbines, for the train. In fact, this picture is a geological picture. So for a circular economy, you know that this is one of the way we have to go on and we have to increase it the, in, the, in the next years for a lot of part. Circular economy, this is not only recycling, and this is a lot of produce and a lot of way before recycling. Recycling is the end and the bad end of the, the circular economy with this, no, this is well known at the moment. Huh? The new fabrication tools, which is important for ICT in my point of view, and the recycling. And recycling, you have to create the ore and the moment eight, only 8% eight of the smart moon are brought to the recycling area in Belgium. And I'm sure that you know that because if you go home, you go into the, the, the desk where you compile all the old smartphone, all, uh, all things. So if you ever recycle AQI, 90%, each cycle, you lost 10%. First cycle, second cycle, you have 90% of 90%. Third cycle, 90% of 81 and so on. At the seventh cycle, you need less than the half of the material you have at the beginning. Simple. And for a smartphone, you have a lot, a large variety, but various quantities. This is quantities in grams. And this column is in fact the other, just over there. This is in milligrams. And this column is the other, just over there. This is in milligrams, but a few milligrams. So you have a lot of raw materials, but they are diversified and in various quantities, which is difficult to recycle. Each metallurgist is directly constat that it will be difficult to recycle antimony, for instance. So, you have to supply the loop. Each circular economy, you have to supply the loop. Because the loop, without nothing, recycle nothing. In mining. And you, when you know the IPCC, this is well known for two decades, it also exists an ER panel and this ER panel mentioned that for a sustainability sen scenario with two degrees Celsius more than the moment in 60, you will extract not 92 billion tons, but this. And business as usual means this. This is not my, con my, uh, the, my way, this is ERP report. 
And this is especially true for metals. Now, sustainability. But mainly for non-metallic minerals with more than a large increase for non-metals. So where to find it? In asteroids, 92 billion tons. A lot of shuttles to take a few grams for each shuttle. It will take a lot of shuttles for 92 billion tons. In the, within the ocean, there are a lot of prospection for two decades at least to take this, this kind of uh, polymetallic nodules. But this is, this generates a lot of impact for the benthic flora and fauna, of course. In Europistine areas, Antarctica is well known for geologists and well known by geologists for these flags, including Belgium. Ah, yes. So you have to take the loop into the earth deeper with larger volumes and lower grades, natural. This is easy to understand, of course. So to avoid transport, to reduce our dependency to raw material and to take the European citizen involved, some suggest that we have to mine locally in Western Europe. Imagine that. Imagine that now you will have a new mine close to your home. And there are a lot of resources in Europe, including in Belgium, two points, a lot of in France. These black points are lithium in Portugal, <laughs> including in Belgium. So I did an analyze in my garden. What about it? A lot of money, maybe. And there is neodymium in my garden. This is true. <laughs> but this is 0.0027. The energy I have to transform this the techniques I have to produce to transform this into an uh, ore is large, very large. So I have to have a look elsewhere. Belgium is very complicated for no Belgian because this is a, a regional uh, a region, uh, a country with a lot of region, three regions, Wallonia and uh, Flanders. And in Wallonia, because it depends on Wallonia, you have a lot of potential resources, and this is an old district of lead and zinc, producing a lot of zinc and a lot of lead in the past. So, we can suggest this. What about a prospection in this old district? But this is a similar way for other countries, mainly in France, Italy, Portugal for lithium. This is, at the moment, the case. This is, of course, for lead and zinc, but this is well known that this is for new metals, gallium, germanium, and indium, very useful for the ICT. So if, if you have a meeting with the citizens and the local residents, it's of course not possible at all to have a new quarry mine in Belgium because you know this, of course. And it is probably the same if you mention, if you ask to me, what about a new mine just close to your garden? It's difficult for me to understand it. With a lot of reason. First, what a meaning for a citizen it is that. It pollutes, it smells, it makes noise, it's not friendly. It destroys the flora and the fauna for the citizen. This is the, the world's I have when I ask to people, what about the mine for you? What about the quarry for you? This is this. Did it increase the cartridge? This is true. It destroyed the landscape during the mining. And you have a lot of topics here which are not geology, not geology at all. It destroyed the landscape after the mining. It is a question of big money. 
It is dangerous for workers. This is a picture in the States. I have the picture in, the, in Wallonia. This is not so impressive, but it exists. It is dangerous for workers. It has been popularized for the last decade, at least. It is st a stress for the citizen due to potential economic shortage. Not possible to reach this. It is a, a geological uh, lingo. It is impossible to understand the first slide of the, the teaching in uh, raw material. It is a geopolitical stress. This is well known from February this year. You can see that the eighth producer of iron of the world was Ukraine, was Ukraine. China is the main country processing the, the ore and some countries are, are the leader for the extraction of these ores. Not at all European Union, of course. For Belgian people, this is a question in the mind of uh, a lot of sociological aspects for Belgian people, at least at Northern French people also. This is the case also in Wales, in the United Kingdom, with a lot of immigration, uh, germinal, this is a book in French, and so on. So, you, the citizen says, what about uh, sustainable development? I stop the fossil fuels and then the World Bank published this report. What about the low carbon new technologies? It will require a lot of new material. The crowd will limit the older land management. This is against recycling. And this is against our relation to, with nature. So, Many thanks, because I had to propose a first view, the state of the art, and we, you will receive the solution now. This is not my topic, I'm not able to provide solution to this. But this is the case for, for Olivier. Good morning, everyone. I need to switch the computer. so. During that, uh, not the computer, the presentation, sorry. While I do that, I would like to thank Paul, uh, who lent me a battery, because of course I forgot to take a battery for the pointer. So thank you very much. And here we go. Quick question, first of all, who is based in Belgium among you? Okay, in Europe? Okay, and outside Europe? Okay, just to have a uh, quick idea of uh, the interest that you may have for the Belgian Institute for Sustainable IT. Um, why do we talk about sustainable IT? Well, you've heard about the mining, I'll come back to that, but one of the things that we start hearing quite recently in, uh, in the media is that uh, IT emits more greenhouse gas emissions than, uh, greenhouse gas, sorry, than the airline industry. Something that was completely unknown until recently and we used to uh, be told to take less planes, less cars, etc. and never think about the usage that we make of IT. Actually, you've seen for uh, the, the, the metals, etc. but there's lots of pollution that arise because of the extraction, because of the uh, manufacturing of our equipment and also because of the waste that our equipment creates and also quite a lot of uh, social impacts. You've seen the extraction, uh, the con working condition in the extraction, but uh, also working condition in the uh, manufacturing industries to create manufacturer equipment. And then in the use phase, there's actually several types of uh, impacts. It can be problems of accessibility, inclusion. It can be problems of uh, addiction, uh, all different types of uh, uh, social problems. And then again, uh, working living conditions on the dumps. Uh, landfills where our equipment end up. Unfortunately, there's uh, the, the vast majority of our equipment uh, ends up in landfills despite all the, the uh, collection and uh, 
supposedly recycling. Uh, just to tell you, Interpol estimates that more than 60% of our equipment ends up in landfills, uh, in traffic, um, and uh, Greenpeace estimates that it's 90%. So the truth must be somewhere between 60 and 90% of our equipment going into landfills. What we try to do is to translate sustainable development terms from people, planet, prosperity into IT actions. And the first one is about green IT, how to reduce the footprint of IT itself. The second one is about um, IT for green, how can we maximize the environmental benefits that IT can bring. And then the same question from a social perspective, how can we reduce all the problems related to uh, ethics, uh, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence, etc. But also how can we create services that really help human and society at large. So what we did is that in France we created an institute uh, in, 19, in, 20, in 2019, in 2020 in Belgium and 2021 in Switzerland and we hope to open other countries. And we have a good mix of different types of organization, uh, big companies, very small ones, associations, public administrations, etc. And very briefly in Belgium, for those of you who are based in Belgium, you see that we have that good mix, also universities, high schools, etc. The idea of the, the association is to bring all these actors together so that we can think of and, and create content uh, depending on the type of topics. So it will be transversal, for example, if we talk about infrastructure, artificial intelligence, blockchain, etc. Or it can be very specific how to manage a big uh, company, how to manage a, a small SME uh, or public service. So we have plenty of uh, working groups, a forum, etc. Coming back to the impact. So You've seen already all the, the mining, etc. Actually, there's several types of uh, impact. So abiotic resources, that's mainly uh, linked to, to, to metal. There's the, the electricity consumption, water, greenhouse gas, and energy over the whole life cycle. And in terms of pollution, the source could be the user equipment. So your smartphone, smartwatch, uh, security camera at home, whatever. Uh, the, the networks, uh, 4G, 5G, 3G, uh, Wi-Fi, etc., and all this to connect to the data centers. Which one do you think is the biggest polluter? Is it data center, network, or user equipment? Data center. Okay. Networks? Not many. User equipment? Not bad. There seems to be a small majority on user equipment. It's actually that. Most of the time people think it's data centers, I must tell you, in the different conferences that I make. And you can see that actually the biggest number is there, 75% of abiotic resources compared to the much lower number. This is simply linked to the number of equipment that we have. A bit less than 100 million servers, 60 to 70 million servers in the data centers in the world. One, a bit more than 1 billion devices for network around 40, 40 billion uh, user equipment. So the vast amount, the, the, the massive amount of devices that we have uh, and that we continue to manufacture and that we uh, replace very, very quickly. Smartphones, for example, have an average view uh, lifetime of two years, roughly. Uh, we replace so quickly that we need to continuously manufacture new equipment. And so it's really true, the user equipment, actually, that we can make the biggest, the biggest savings. Uh, in terms of being more environmentally friendly, it's about extending the lifetime of our equipment, and that can be done through different different ways that I'll briefly talk about. And it's not just us telling that. If you look at the statistics that uh, Apple publishes, for example, for smartphone, over the whole life cycle of the, the, the smartphone, it emits 72 kilograms of uh, carbon emissions. Um, and also, by the way, it really, so a smartphone of something like 120 gram requires roughly 200, 200 kilos of rock, as uh, uh, Johan already explained a bit. And if you look at the life cycle, 79, so almost 80% comes from the uh, production uh, of the, the equipment. 80%, that means that when you buy your smartphone, before you switch it on, you already have emitted 60 uh, kilograms of uh, emissions, uh, carbon emissions, and only the rest will come later. When you see transport, that includes, for example, the, um, 
the, the, the packaging. If you are told that your smartphone is really green because the packaging is fully recycled, etc., it's not the case at all, unfortunately. And then the rest comes into the, the, the usage phase in terms of impact. And all these, because of the extraction, as you've seen, there's roughly 60 different types of uh, uh, materials in a, in a smartphone, and only 17 of them can be recycled today for economical and uh, physical reasons. It, they are not, uh, in all cases, recycled, but it's the limit that Yumiko told us that they can recycle today. So you see that, as you have already mentioned, there's a lot of loss every time we uh, been uh, uh, um, or you try to recycle a smartphone. So really the, the, the solution is to extend the lifetime of the equipment. And when we manufacture equipment, it has an impact in terms of pollution. We are told for years already that our uh, greenhouse gas emissions are decreasing in countries like Belgium and France, etc. But actually when you take into account the import, uh, imported equipment that we have, it's increasing year by year. And this is something that we are not told so much. And if you think about IT, all the devices, almost all the devices that we have, except some, uh, some uh, sensors, etc., but the vast majority are uh, imported. And so it means that we are exporting our pollution to the different countries. Unfortunately, as you know, there's no frontier for uh, pollution. In terms of usage, the biggest impact, uh, well, the impact is related directly to data, data that you transmit, data that you process, etc. And the vast, uh, amount, the vast majority of the data relates to online video and other types of video. Here, you've got the websites without their video, you've got your emails, you've got some file transfer, etc. So if you have been told that you will save the planet by deleting your old emails, I can tell you it's not true. It helps, but it's not true. The big thing that you can do in terms of usage is reduce the quantity of video, the quantity of pictures, because these are the ones that are transmitting the biggest amount of data. Video, it will be reduce the quantity of uh, Netflix. Watch less Netflix, uh, avoid binge watching, and if you are watching things like Netflix, etc., try to um, take a lower definition. Don't take 4K or even uh, HD. If you can go for a lower definition, it reduces the quantity of data that you are transmitting and that really helps a lot. Um, the, especially if you're on a smartphone or a tablet, there's no point at watching it in 4K for sure. Uh, if you're watching pornography typically, try to do it a bit faster, it will help as well. <laughs> Then you've got tubes, etc. Typically, if you're watching YouTube, if you're listening to music with YouTube, take Spotify instead because you don't have the, the, the image going along. So there's small things that you can do in terms of usage, but there's a lot that can be done also uh, from an application point of view, we'll see that. But video is really very impactful. Before COVID, in 2018, um, the orange part that you see there emitted 306 million tons of CO2. That's an equivalent of 306 million passengers flying Brussels to New York. It's not a small amount. Of course, it increased massively with the COVID crisis. Everyone was home, either playing games or watching Netflix or trying to pretend that they are working uh, online. If they are working online, then they are in that category with the Zoom and Teams, etc., also increasing. So what can companies do? What can organizations do? Uh, cities, uh, uh, any organization can do, and why should they act? Well, first of all, there's really a lot that you can do in terms of reducing your footprint, um, acting for inclusivity and accessibility, I'll show a, a short example. Uh, for companies, the CSR strategy is something usually very important in paper, but it's something where you can act truly in all the IT teams as well. And then it brings cost reduction, uh, risk reduction, you can get prepared for new regulations that are, that are being prepared at the moment. I don't know if some of you or any of you suffered a bit from uh, GDPR. Actually, uh, we could go in the same direction with eco-design. Uh, so for companies that were not ready for GDPR, it meant a lot of sudden uh, additional development that needed to be done to protect data, etc. Uh, I was in a company that was already very good for that, uh, for very fortunately, and so we were able during that implementation of GDPR to catch up uh, our uh, competition and go above uh, and beyond our competition thanks to the fact that we were ready for GDPR regulations. Um, so that was pretty good and it could be the same today for uh, environmental perspective and social ones in IT. 
Typically, I just mentioned GDPR. What we see coming are regulations at European level, at country level, around um, eco-design of applications and equipment, um, also about typically greenwashing, how to avoid greenwashing in IT, and then all the aspect about accessibility. And you may think it's something that is only for IT, but actually everyone has got a role to play in the organization. It will be about communicating internally and externally about your, your, your initiative, but mainly the first thing that marketing will do is they are the one who request to IT what to put on a website. It's not IT who decides what to put on a website. If the marketing tells you that you have to put a 4K video on the homepage of your, of your website with an automatic start, etc., you can't change that unless you really convince them. So they need to be involved. You can involve your purchasing department, finance department, of course, management. And then one which becomes more and more interesting is risk management department. More and more they start realizing that unsustainability is a vulnerability for the organization. And so we have working groups specific on that, especially with insurances, uh, banks, etc. Also governments start to look at that, that aspect, typically also related to uh, the availability of uh, the metals, as you mentioned. So the areas of actions, we will work first and foremost on equipment, end user equipment, uh, equipment in data center, etc. And for that we can, it's all related to buying less, requiring less uh, capacity actually. So we'll see how to, to create, a, uh, to, to minimize the requirement, but also how to keep longer, how to maintain the equipment, how to give a second life to the equipment, because we've seen that the recycling and the end of life unfortunately will not work. In terms of digital use, we still can, of course, uh, inform our users to reduce the quantity of emails, the quantity of files that they transfer, etc. It's something good, for sure. Uh, how to reduce the, the quantity of data, depending on how you use collaborative tools, for example. There are many things that can be done. But the biggest thing that we can do as IT professionals is about eco-designing the applications. And eco-designing, um, it will, the first question that, w w that you will ask yourself is, actually, what can I avoid to develop? Because when you look at the statistics about how many percents of the functionalities in an application are actually used, they are very, very low. Uh, so it, it's all about agile practice. It's develop what you, the, your, your minimum, uh, your MVP, and then increase slowly and surely, but stop when you don't need to develop anymore. That helps you also in terms of maintenance, technical depth, etc. but mainly it will re require less uh, computing capacity. So you will be looking at writing better code. Anyone can tell me why I've got this, uh, this picture of uh, the, the lem next to the code? Any idea? Yeah. Yeah, the quantity of code that was uh, actually because of the quantity of memory available, the quantity of code that was in the in the, the computer running the LEM is 70 kilobytes. That's roughly an email today without an attachment. Um, but of course, we are not trying to aim to that. But you can easily avoid, for example, uh, very large uh, libraries or automatic uh, code generation, etc. That helps you to reduce the bandwidth needs, that helps you to divide, really, these numbers are divisions in terms of number of servers required per user to run the same service. Um, it helps you to extend the lifetime of the equipment of your end user. Let's say, for example, that you would develop an application that would run, so you have a web banking application, let's say, and you say, ah, I want a new feature, but that new feature, I'm doing something completely stupid and extreme here, but it would only run on 5G, then I upgrade my whole application to 5G. It means that all your users will need to upgrade their smartphone to 5G. If you say, okay, that new feature I cannot do without 5G, but all the rest of my web banking still uh, can run on 4G, you create an application that has both of these and just the functionality requiring 5G, you launch that, and only the users that re really require that functionality will need to upgrade their smartphone. It's an extreme example, but actually it works the other way around. With all the upgrades of uh, Android and iOS, etc., if you are able to support all the versions, you allow your users to keep their smartphone longer. And for many of them, it's not just a question of willing or not to, to, to buy a, a smartphone. Some of them simply don't have enough money to buy new smartphones anymore. So it's a question of actually having more clients in the end if you are able to support more, um, more systems. Also, more clients simply because you look at their potential handicaps. There's, if you look at, for example, uh, all the people, one uh, person uh, out of four in, uh, sorry, 
And it, for people above, uh, above 65 years of age, uh, one person of four is uh, handicapped. In the world, and all ages included, one person in seven is handicapped. If you don't take into account the handicaps, you may cut yourself from a large uh, base of clients or citizens. And of course, for companies, that's uh, all elements that help in terms of business growth. And you have different tools that you can use to assess whether you are uh, roughly eco-designed or not. That's just the website of the, the event here, 64%. If you are accessible or not, this one is pretty good, uh, only four errors and uh, eight contrast errors. That's very low. Um, these are only small tools to give you a hint, but experts can go much, much uh, further than that. And handicaps, just to give you an idea, if we look at color blindness, for example, if, you're, if you are giving that kind of uh, graph for someone who is colorblind, good luck to read it. Let's say that you use that internally with your colleagues to, or with your boss, for example, to ask for a salary increase, and you show him this and he's colorblind, he will potentially see it like that, or completely gray, or anything. 8% um, of men are colorblind. One in 12 person, one in 12 men is colorblind. Only 0.5% of women, but 8% of men, that's massive. So if you create something slightly different, suddenly it becomes accessible. It's not just for websites, it's for all your daily usage of uh, IT to communicate with your colleagues as well. So, very briefly to finish, if you want resources, we've got uh, on our website, we've got links to different tools, MOOCs, guides, etc. Unfortunately, not all of the guides are available in English yet because we have a big collaboration with the French government and they are a bit slower to translate to English. Um, we propose the membership, we propose a charter, and we have an annual signing ceremony for the charter, and we propose a label as well. So membership, become a member, take part in our uh, working groups, etc. to get the training. The charter, it's uh, independent, you can just sign the charter without uh, being a member, and this is about a moral commitment of your organization to go towards more sustainability in IT, more equi um, uh, all the aspects about, uh, for example, men and women in IT also being equal, etc. And then, uh, if you want to go further, there's the possibility to pass a label, the three are independent, but of course you are encouraged to take the three of them. What to remember, buy less equipment, um, buy refurbished if you can, uh, give a second life to your equipment and only as a last resort, recycle but make sure that it does not stay in your cupboard. The, the, the booklet there, the electronic, uh, is just to give you an idea, if you buy an electronic bo uh, book reader, it's roughly equivalent to 68 books per year that you would need to buy. So you can ask yourself the question, do I need the electronic version or is the paper quite interesting still? Data, reduce the video streaming, I've already mentioned. Also avoid watching video on 4G or 3G. If you can download the video before leaving uh, when you are still on the Wi-Fi uh, connection. And as mentioned, use something like Spotify rather than YouTube if it's only for music. And then still use less emails. It's not so much about deleting emails, it's about avoiding sending emails in the first and foremost and avoiding uh, file transfer in the emails. Use other platforms like Swiss Transfer, uh, we transfer, etc. And just one last thing. This one I quite like. If you need to print something from a website, use that printwhatyoulike.com. It helps you select f the elements that you want from a page and only print some of the elements and not all the publicity, etc. Very small and easy tool to use on a daily basis for the guys who like to print. And that's it for me. Thank you.